Hey. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another instalment of the Business School Professional Lecture Series. Um, today I'm joined by my colleague um, Gurjeet from the Business School, who you'll see on screen. Um, Gurjeet's lecture today is entitled Towards Modelling and Measuring the Non-Random Walk Down Wall Street. And I'll be handing over just shortly. Um, I'm the Corporate Events Manager for London South Bank University. My name is Neil hudson Basing. I just have a short um, webinar statement um, that I'd like to read out and then I'll be uh, just talking you through the Zoom functionality before I hand over. So everyone speaking at or attending an LSBU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSBU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing learning, celebrating and bringing communities together. LSBU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination. Inappropriate behaviour, including that that potentially impacts or contradicts LSBU's reputation and values, will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any of this behaviour will also be removed from the webinar. We want our events to be an enjoyable, safe and warm experience for all. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Um, so just to take you through the functionality, um, you'll see the chat box and it's fantastic to see people making use of that already. Please continue to use the chat box and um, it helps us to break down the virtual wall that we're all experiencing at the moment um, and that hopefully we won't have to experience too much longer. Um, to ask a question later, please pop your camera and mic on if you're happy to or pop it in the chat box. We're really keen for this to be an interactive session and get some open dialogue going. Um, so if you are comfortable to ask your question in person, please do pop your camera on. Um, that's all for now. Please share your thoughts and comments on Twitter as well. You can, ta you can uh, tag us at, at LSBU or at LSBU underscore business biz and I'll pop those in the chat box. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Gurji. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Deal. Thank you for uh, setting this all up and uh, yeah, guiding me through the functionality of Zoom, etc. And thank you everyone for being here. Such a great turnout. So thank you guys. Thank you for your time for uh, turning up to this. Maybe I can entertain you for the next few minutes. And if I don't, I do apologize in advance. On that note, let me share the screen. Right, okay, should, you should be able to see the screen at the moment and then I should put this on read, read only. Uh oh, reading view, yep, reading view. <coughs> All right, so you probably heard of this book was uh, called A Random Walk Down Wall Street came by, I don't know, 25, 30, maybe longer. The guy was Mel Keel um, and it was probably one of the best sellers around. And Random Walk was like saying, okay, all the prices are inherent already. We can't really beat the market. We're doing all this stuff running around for no reason because the price tomorrow is gonna to be the price today plus some shock. Uh, anyway, there's some criticisms on that. Well, not criticism, you can be ob certain observations, even in simple bar charts and histogram that that may not be the case. So this talks entitled slightly with the word a non-random walk down Wall Street. So I'm basically, I've got a, I've got a direction to go down Wall Street, it's not random, I'm going straight to the pub. Uh, anyway, first of all, this, this project has been going on for a few years when we started looking at the histogram of returns coming from prices. Uh, and we noticed that equity is not normally distributed, it's peaked and has this thing called fat tails. And it's just not me in the story. There are many people working together and being inspired by many authors, etc. And the, one of the guys is Marcel Auslos, who's here with us today. He's been working on this as a part of the team. So thank you, Marcel, for giving us all the, your advice. There's uh, Bilal Shaquille, who started working with me earlier on. He's uh, finished his PhD. He's now at De Montfort. There's Babur Saeed was on the program. He worked on this as well. Uh, Rashad Amon another PhD student of mine, worked on this. 
recently, Valeria has been taking this to another level by actually introducing a lot of automation into the programs and so on. And then there's Stefano Marmani, who's also worked on this, Tamila Maggi. So it's quite a big team. I haven't put the names down here. And then other, all my other uh, friends and colleagues who actually who I talked to and uh, who worked together on this. Right, let's, before we move on to the next slide, I just want to talk a little about this thing. There's a thing called a normal distribution. I think most of you are familiar with what a normal distribution is. More normal distribution is a symmetric distribution. It's got a bell shape. And it's got very defined properties because it's governed by, a, well, it's given by a mathematical equation. It's set up so that the area underneath the curve is one. And there are only two parameters in it. One is the mean value, which tells you where the middle point of the distribution is located, the mean, median, and the mode, because it's symmetric. And the standard deviation, which tells you how dispersed the distribution is. And if you go a certain point away from the mean, you'll know exactly what area is in the bulk and what area is left at the tail. Why is it called the normal distribution? Because it happens quite a lot of the time as well normal to actually for it to actually be evidence um so normal distribution bell shaped symmetric certain defined properties only two parameters mean uh, mean and sigma mean is that measure of your know, location and sigma tells you how dispersed the distribution is okay so bearing that in mind we can now move on to the next slide which i can do myself Oops. Um, Gurji, just to let you know, the slides are not moving along, actually. I'm not sure what, why that might be. Interesting. Oh, oh there's oh, another There thing. we go. Oh, no, I, oh, I, haven't, oh, I haven't moved any slides along yet. I was just talking. Oh, good. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I can carry on talking nonsense without moving slides. I mean, this is the first slide that has to be moved on. So what are we going to cover? We're going to cover the preamble, which I've been <laughs> rambling on already for a while. Um, and then we're going to look at the Brownian motion very quickly and what, is, what features of it links with the, with the concept of uh, the movement of prices, uh, how prices develop. And by looking at Brownian motion and the prices, from the prices, we can look at the returns. From there, we'll see that the Brownian motion generates a normal distribution for returns distribution. However, the observed distributions of returns from prices, which are assets, is actually leptocurti, which is peak distribution of the fat tails. So then we'll say, well, this peak, peak and so on has, has been observed for a long time. Uh, Mendel brought a set of started working on it very, very early days. Uh, use the concept of fractals to understand it. There have been many other attempts by imposing other distributions like T distributions or Levi flight morals, uh, stable distributions, jump diffusion processes, and so on and so forth to actually model the underlying peak at distribution. A few years ago, we started looking at it and we decided to use a different approach and we called it what's called the irrational fractional Brownian version. So we introduced that. Once we introduced that, that it has contained a new function and we look at that function and we figure out whether that function can also explain and measure and model irrational behavior. Then we'll introduce the concept of the psychological soliton. And then lastly, we introduce how this model can be used for making some forecasts, especially forecasts on the tails and kurtosis. Okay, uh, as I said, it's only, I'm only going to talk about 20 minutes. I haven't got much time, can't go into each bit in detail. So just give a kind of semi-overview about the stuff. <coughs> okay, so the price in the next time period or in a little while's time is the price which happens at the moment. The rest is an exponential. The reason is that it's the logarithm of the price which defines the return when you look at continuous distributions. But if you're not, don't feel comfortable looking at that, just look at the APROX equ equation below that the price in the next period is going to be the general drift that's happened in the data set over the last, I don't know, hundreds of steps, find the mean value, plus the price in the last 
in the current period, plus some exogenous shock, okay? Um, this is basically what's called the weak form of fish and market hypothesis. All the information and prices have been absorbed. Everything, you know, the market knows what's happened. Information has been absorbed and you really can't beat the market. So the best you can say about the price in the next period is the general drift plus the price in the current period. There could be an exogenous shock, some kind of shock, but we can't really model that because the expected value of a shock is zero. In this case, we say the shock is taken from the normal distribution. So this shock is actually comes from a distribution with mean value zero and some variant sigma squared or some standard deviation sigma. And here Z is the number, random number drawn from the normal distribution. So if you don't like the maths at the top too much, just think that the price in the next period is gonna be the price today plus the general drift. Okay? This is also, this equation can also be viewed as a random walk model. And this can also be linked to what people call the rational behavior of investors. It, when people call rational, that doesn't mean that they're like the rational ones who wear a suit and a tie and do the right thing. Whereas people might say the irrational ones are going do la la on the streets. Rational behavior in this kind of sense means they observe rational expectations. They like to buy things when they're lower priced and sell things at a higher price. And so they actually, based on that, we can actually have this thing called the efficient market hypothesis. And this is what's called the random walk model as well, that equation. And that's why the book was called the random walk down Wall Street, which Mal Keel wrote a few years back. Um, now, if this was the case and the system did behave like this, then you can do simulations on this particular equation by taking it, taking a number drawn randomly from the normal distribution, and you can generate a path of prices. From the from the path of prices or the price trajectory, you can find the returns at each time step. You can find the returns at each time step based on a discrete approach, which is a difference in the price divided by last price, or you can find the returns through a continuous, uh, the continuous return, uh, which is that the continuous return is the logarithm of the price relatives. It does, okay, we don't like the logarithm of the price relative, just think about the difference in prices divided by the price yesterday. So that's the returns, you have hundreds of returns, you can find out what the size of the returns are, you can put them into a histogram. And if this was the case, based on the geometric Brownian motion, then the, the distribution for returns you will get will be, a normally, will be normally distributed. Okay, um, at this point, just quickly link this, that, this is also called a Brownian motion because it actually goes, it's to do with a guy called Robert Brown, who was a, was a botanicist in the 19th century. We can talk about that later on if your time allows. And then we can also say that this particular motion is also what was used to actually model the diffusion of some say particle in a liquid or gas by Einstein, okay? So the price, the, the, this distribution Brownian motion in this form, uh, is pretty analogous to the just to the work done by Einstein by looking at diffusion of particles in the gas. And the guy who did this actually for the prices side was actually did it just a little bit before actually Einstein and a little known figure, but now very well known. It's called Bachelier, but and the little bugger died quite young. On the on that note, what can we do in a parsimonious way to change this model? such that we can turn the normal distribution, we can turn the return distribution from a normal distribution to a more peaked distribution with fatter tails such that it fits onto the observed returns distributions data. As I said, the work on factor has been going back quite a few years, now back to 60s, I suppose, maybe earlier, the work of Mandel brought and then different exogenously imposed distributions, and then other models like jump diffusion processes and so on. Um, we're just messing around with some experiment which we had set up for assessment and looked at 
demand supply imbalances. And based on that, after various trials and errors and reverse engineering, <clears throat> we decided to amend the Brownian motion by introducing the extra term KFZT. Now, if you look at it, the first two terms are the same, mu delta T plus sigma ZT squared root delta T. That's what we had before. I mean, people who are familiar with this might think as a Wiener process and so on. Uh, then you put the extra term on, which is some function of Z of T. K is a parameter, yeah, something that can be estimated. The extra function, kind of in backward reverse engineering, we'll find out later on, which actually gave us very good results is given below, which is a mixture of a trigonometric function, the arc tan function, which is a, a kink-shaped function, which is multiplied by a thing in the bracket, which is a Gaussian type function. The reason for this particular function will become clearer maybe why, why, why this function works well, well when we come back to it later on in a bit. As you notice now, in this particular set of equations, there are four parameters, the mean value mu, sigma the standard deviation, and two extra parameters have been introduced, little c and little k or capital K, let's just look at little k. Um, what we do, mu and sigma we take from the historic data. We change C and K through many different time steps on an array. And we choose the best, we choose the value of C, C and K, we call them C optimal, K optimal, which fits the simulations generated from this model on to the returns distribution, okay? So we have to estimate parameters C and K based on various simulations, which is a lot of hard background computer crunching. And we use certain math goodness of fit statistics like the chi-squared statistics or Euclidean measures such that the fit is as best as possible, yeah? The, we have a fit for purpose model. Um, so, Let's look at, say, I won't show you the, the full mechanism and details of how it's done here. We haven't got the time. <clears throat> so with fitting a fit for purpose parsimonious model, say, for example, for a particular data set, this is data set S&P 500 daily data, beginning of 210 and 211. Uh, the histogram, that's the little binny bits, yeah? That's the real data. The green, is the fit which comes from the Brownian motion, which is a normal distribution. As you can see, the green doesn't fit the bins, the skyscraper, yeah? It doesn't fit it very well. But when we introduce our extra function, Fz, and we run simulations on various values of C and K, and the ones we choose which fit the best, fits it best, by looking at goodness of fit statistics is the value of K is 0 0.006 and C is 0 0.6. We actually get a fit, which actually fits the returns distribution very well. Okay, so hence that's the proof of the pudding that we can fit leptokurtic distribution endogenously generated via function, which is extension of the Brownian function Brownian model, there's no extra variables being introduced. We still have the variable Z, but we only have two extra parameters, K and C to be estimated. All well and good, modeling is good, is nice to actually come up with a model which fits the raw data. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's good enough. It's a pat on the back. What else can we do? Is this, ex this, extra prep, this extra function Fz, is it kind of connected to some kind of irrationality or this so-called irrationality or this so-called contrarian behavior of investors? Rather than you know, the, the basic rational guys, is there something we can link this function with which, which links with the, the contrarian idea? Like you know, when the people say the, the bull market, the bear market, and the lethargic market, 
people go buy, 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 and then they sell, 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 and they say, oh, I can't be asked, I want to go to sleep and do something else. Can we actually kind of link this function with this so-called irrational behavior? But let's sketch this function out. This FZ function, when you sketch it out, has this particular shape. The, the, si the sinusoidal shape in the middle is, is, comes from actually inducing that e to the minus c z squared divided by two minus one. And the uh, asymptotes on the, on the left and the right come from the arc tan function because they kind of asymptote out, yeah? They have a certain limits to it. It doesn't keep on growing. Um, if you look at the region above Z1 root plus with a positive feedback region on the right-hand side, that's called the, that's a positive, con, positive contrarians. They want to buy stuff when the prices are going up. And this is what actually makes the returns, the absolute size of the returns bigger. And as the absolute size of the return gets bigger, you introduce a fat tail to the right. And the complete inverse on the other side is the area below Z minus root, region six, the positive feedback on the left-hand side region. And that's the sell, sell, sell guys. When prices are falling, they actually sell even more, making the price fall even more. So that induces a bigger absolute change in return on the negative side. And the guys in that, the negative feedback region in the middle is the lethargic pay area. People are so bored of not the market not doing anything that they do the inverse of what the market is doing. And that area basically ends up peaking the distribution. So that part of FZ ends up peaking the distribution and the other two things start end up um, flat, fattening the tails. The bigger the value of the K, the bigger the fat tails, the, the asymptotes actually go rise up higher, the amplitude becomes much bigger. And the C tells you where that function crosses the horizontal axis. So it's the onset of the tails. So C kind of measures the onset of the tails. Little K measures the amplitude of fatness of the tails. So in essence, somehow kurtosis is a mixture of C and K. The onset of the tails in C is inversely related. So somehow in our heads, we think that maybe kurtosis is somehow linked to K divided by C or the ratio of K over C. Anyway, what I've been just saying, we can actually, I wrote, we wrote this uh, in uh, Wilmore. And in a way, sometimes people say she shouldn't really read from the slide, but sometimes say, bugger it, I'm going to read it. I think it's quite actually well written, so I am going to read it. So irrational behavior captured. For example, when the upturn in the news is minimal, agents irrationally become impatient, sell the assets, and, and invest in alternative products. Next, consider the two positive feedback regions where the sigmoid function has smoothly taken over and now dominates. The positive feedback region corresponds to large positive Z values, and FZ is greater than zero. Models measure the Agents riding the waves of euphoria, greed, and rational exuberance, and hence buy, buy, and buy. In the other positive feedback region corresponding to large negative values of K, the function is less than zero. The aggregate fear and panic of cell, cell, cell of the rational agents is so modeled. The negative, negative feedback region effectively peaks the returns to normal distribution near the origin. The smooth takeover by the sigmoid function giving rise to the positive feedback regions flatters the distribution when it's leading to longer tails. This measuring process of the rational agent behavior has been found to finally model the leptokurtic distribution of returns. If you go back to this equation again, this kind of behavior, this kink shape and the, the sinusoidal behave, behavior in the middle persists over many, many time periods. The C and K moves so there's a fluctuation in this way, but it stays like that. Agents are actually non-adapting. And this is what in, uh, we term the coin that this is a, the psychological soliton. So this equation, this is, is, a, is a, a solution to some maybe 
bigger differential equation where this solution is, is, a, is a basically a soliton, but it's a psychological soliton of the mindset of the investors. Anyway, we claim that, of course, it needs to be justified further. We'll, self, we'll see how to take this further on later on. Okay, so I only looked at the model. We see how the model actually can provide fit for purpose models for uh, modeling terms distribution of asset prices. We can link this also with irrational behavior or, fi or financial behavior up to a certain point. Uh, we, rather than just talking about it, we can actually measure this irrational behavior. And then next one is probably, can we, have, can we do something to make some forecasts? Can we use this model to make some kind of forecasts on the fatness of the tails and so on? So <clears throat> we think of now if I set, setting up an econometric forecasting methodology. Points to remember, those are the two equations. Fatness and onset of the tails of the tail distribution depends on K and C, in fact, kind of K divided by C. So kurtosis therefore depends on K and C. To forecast kurtosis, need to forecast K and C in the next time period. Okay. K and C gives you an idea about for, of kurtosis. So if we can forecast K and C in the next time period, then we, we may be able to forecast kurtosis. So in, in doing so, we set up many, we set up consecutive time windows. In this particular experiment, well, real life data experiment. We took 33 windows, each window of two years of the S&P coming from 1950 to the current day. So we got about 33-ish windows, two year data, daily data. We found the kurtosis, found the C and Q, K value for each of those two years. <coughs> so as we got a time series data on C and K, we may be able to make a some kind of forecast on C and K respectively. Um, so let's look at C. Oh, before, before we look at C, we quite find something quite interesting here. These are the, the 33 windows plotted with, with KC ratio. And you can see three outliers, 62, 63, 86, 87, and 2007, 86, 87 has the financial crash. So fat tails generally appear in financial crash years. Eight, seven, eight, yep, financial crash appear in those times. 62, 63 uh, is the Cuban Missile Crisis, but this outlier didn't exist because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was, was actually more to do with the fact that it was when I was born. But we can discuss that later on, okay? Not, not the Cuban Missile Crisis, age of birth. All right. <laughs> so anyway, for the C business, quite good actually. We've got a mean reverting equation. We can actually forecast C in the next time period based on the C in the current sample data up to this particular time period. With the information set we got up of CT up to this particular day, we can find or up to this particular year, we can find the value of C in the next particular time period. And to back this up, there's a data below here saying that <clears throat> the T stats is good, the P values are good. So we have, so we do have an autoregressive model, a one step ahead forecasting model for C. When we try to do the same thing for little k, we couldn't quite do it for yearly data. We're working on minute data now, which is much better, but we could still do it for, for k by introducing some transformations, which we picked up by looking at some features of heteroscedasticity, et cetera, et cetera. The model is a bit more, little bit more complicated for forecasting K, but I won't go into the details because 33 past one already. Um, the forecast model for little K is based on this equation. And again, we, we know what K and C are in the last time period. Hence, we can find out what K and C, well, we can forecast what K divided by C will be in the next period. But as we know what C will be in the next period, we can find out what K will be in the next period. So hence we can make decent forecasts on both K and C. If you can make decent forecasts on K and C, maybe we can actually forecast kurtosis in the next period. However, first of all, we have to model, we've got to set up an aggression model where we can build a model of kurtosis based on K and C. 
<clears throat> well, we have, if you look at the third equation, the log of the kurtosis can be modeled on K and C as a ratio. And there's a very strong relationship. And it's not surprising actually, because as I said, K, bigger the K, bigger the fat tails, <clears throat> the smaller the K, the later on the fat tail sets in. So C must be in the, in the denominator. <clears throat> if you ignore the constant, we can say kurtosis is uh, 0 0.078 times you know, log of kurtosis is 0 0.078 log of k or c. Well, there's a basic in intercept term there as well because a certain value exists regardless of, of the value of k and c. So based on these three equations, we can now forecast the kurtosis in the next time period. And in the little table below, we have forecast the kurtosis in the next time period and the error was pretty small. And more than that, if we did know the mean in the next time period, which is a holy grail, then we can actually forecast the returns distribution, full returns distribution in the next time period. And up here, you'll see four bits of information. Uh, the histogram, sorry, the, the bins or the skyscrapers is the observed data from real life. Green is the normal distribution, but doesn't fit. One is a simulated distribution, the pinky, pinky one is a simulated distribution, which fits very well. And if you look at the forecast distribution, that fits right on top of it. So we can actually start to make good forecasts. But remember, it's the forecast on the kurtosis we can make, not forecast on means. Because if you could make forecast on means, you'll all be super rich. And I won't be here talking to you guys. Based on the fact that I can't do <laughs> forecast on returns, and only in kurtosis, I, the stuff that has been work published is listed here, which has uh, last few years. We are currently working on minute data. The results look promising. However, the forecast models are much bit more complicated. And may I, at this moment, thank you all of the, my co-authors and all the other people who worked with me to actually make this uh, a possibility. And on that note, thank you so much for listening and any questions, etc., are very welcome. But if they're hard ones, please direct them at Valerio or Marcel and the easy ones at me. Thank you very much. Grazie. I will unshare the screen. Thank you so much, um, Gurjeet, for, for your lecture. Um, we're ready for questions. So if you have a live question um, that you'd like to ask in, ask in person, please do, um, if you've already got your camera on, please just signal to me that you'd like to ask a question. Um, if, you, uh, if you'd like to ask one and you've not got your camera on, please turn your camera on or pop it in the chat box um, now and I will relay that for you if you're more comfortable doing so. Um, you touched on it briefly, and I'll get I'll get us going. Um, you touched on it briefly, um, Gurji, and we spoke about kind of this before. Why is it called Brownian motion? And kind of like what what tell us a little bit more about that and, and the kind of like person that coined the term. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Robert Brown was a um, botanicist, I think, in the nineteenth century, early nineteenth century. And he was looking at pollen particles and he would put the pollen particles into a liquid and the pollen particle would shift randomly in this and that direction because it got beaten up by the, by the stuff in the water in, in a random way. But I think this, I'm not sure, but I think Brownian motion might have go back to Greek times I think the origin might be sedemesis or something like that, but I can't remember. But then Brownian motion became quite popular later on because of the fact that people want to understand uh, how things dispersed in these fluids, in gaseous and liquid fluids. And there was worked on by Einstein to figure out the laws, how, they were, how, how the diffusion took place. And the diffusion, the rate of diffusion took place with the square root of time. And at the same time, there's a guy called Bichelet who also realized the, the same thing after the diffusion of prices. I think maybe other people might know more about it, but I think that's that's the, that's the origins of Brownian motion, I think. Thank you. Um, any questions from anyone? If um, someone like on our screen would like to ask one, 
um, just pop, pop your hand up if you'd if you if you're ready to. Um, if not, I'll just ask another one. What's the link between this and the concept of black swans? Yeah, um, if you look at normal normal distribution, doesn't allow you as many extreme events as happen in real life. So if you use normal distribution, the number of extreme events that are happening are, are under exaggerated. Extreme events are called black swans because black swans don't hop often happen very often. I think the guy, what's his name? I've forgotten his name now, actually. He wrote the book called Black Swan. Can anyone remember? Seem Taleb. Taleb. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Taleb Giza. Yeah. Taleb. He, wrote the, he made it the book concept of Black Swans famous. So black swans are basically extreme events. And what we do, if you look in fat tails, fat tails pick up extreme events. So hence the concept of fat tails, black swans, extreme events are, are connected together. Thank you very much. And um, we have one in the chat box. Um, oh, Roy, we'll come over to you first. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gurjit. That's very interesting. And um, just a curiosity, because <clears throat> Sometimes in offshore pricing, you model returns through Levy distributions once you have a shape which is not the Brian motion one. So mm -hmm. very peak the shape. So mm -hmm. what's, can you, can you use, use your device, let's say this, this bias of the Brian motion, this irrational bias of the Brian motion, to provide a measurement between the normal course of the returns through the Brian motion and what you should have uh, if you apply a Levy uh, distribution. Yeah, well, can be done. This, what we basically, this is work, we got it in our heads, but it's going to be work to be done. What we need to do is we're going to need to construct a whole statistical tables based on different values of C and K. It, and at that time, we will not be looking at, now looking at actual observed distribution. We're just going to take different values of C and K and construct what peak and color distribution we get. And then the idea is probably to fit for different values of C and K, fit it onto different well, different other distributions, which people are talking about already, like the T distribution, Levy distribution, and so on, and match certain values of C and K onto particular dis exogenously imposed distribution that you talk about. And once we get that, we have a better understanding how to take it further. Yeah. Yeah. But the library, to, we have to construct a library of distributions on different regions of C and K maybe, or different values of C and K, and then as I say, match it onto different distributions like Levi distribution, T distribution and so on to take this a bit further, yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, it'll take some time. But not if you, not, but, but not if you will work with us because <laughs> you, you're bright and you work a lot. Okay, well, thank but, you. <laughs> Dag. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. I was wondering if, you know, you're applying it to stock prices, but uh, maybe commodity prices or other sort of semi-random or, you know, irrational markets, whether the modeling would work there. Yes, Doug, thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, you, if, you got, if you got a distribution, which is a variation of the Brownian motion, Sorry, no, variation of the normal distribution. That means yeah. it's got to be univariate, it got, got, can't be bimodal, and it can't be too skewed. We can apply the same methodology. The C and K will adapt. And at this, in this case, for example, we're looking at platicurta, which is peaked and flat tailed. It can quite easily be the whole thing can be reversed. The K values can take a different sign. If you go to the platycurtic distributions, which are like flatter, but thinner, thinner tails. So rather than go lepto, you can go platy as well, yeah. I mean, it can be applied to, it's just basically changing the value of C and K, uh, 
However, with the proviso that things are not too skewed and this and it's, it's a unimodal distribution. So symmetric unimodal. Right, okay. Yeah, definitely. So if you've got any data sets, we can look at it. Thank you. Most of mine is consumer data and it's not, it's not right for it, but I'm just thinking commodity data might be pretty interesting yeah. to look at. Indeed, absolutely. Um, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Alex, you've got your hand raised if you'd like to ask your question. Well, thank you everyone, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one's an observation and the other one is a question. Um, the observation is my father who like uh, Gurdjieff uh, was very statistical, he did a PhD in maths and he was a long-term investor for uh, many years and he had a stock market principle, which I actually have put in the chat to Gurdjieff, which was that you sell on rumor and you buy on fact, which was a principle that he followed. You know, he would uh, sell things on the basis of speculation that they were not going to be good, and, but he wouldn't buy things on speculation. He'd buy things on fact. And that suggests, you know, two, if that's true still, two mechanisms going on. The second one, which, um, and I'm a, you know, I would be conscious of this in investment terms now, which is the issue of things like tracker funds, where in effect that possibly causes this uh, fat tails because tracker funds in effect is the wisdom of crowd. Uh, the tracker fund will automatically buy stuff simply because that's the way the weather looks. It does it automatically. And I have a number of tracker funds and I, I know that what they invest in has got no human interve intervention at all. It just simply follows the market. So I just wondered whether those two phenomena, um, you know, have some resonance. One is the different mechanism possibly for whether you sell or whether you buy. And the second one is the presence of, if you like, automated decision-making, which has happened in the last over the period of your research, I reckon, Gurdjieff, where there's been um, automation in uh, stock market buying by funds. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert at the actual human side of all of this. I, I can look at stuff and change variables and fit the mm -hmm. data. But however, I will try to answer some of it. Automated funds, if, the, if, the, if these funds, if, if the rules for these funds have been written by investors mm. and they're stuck to the rules that are already, then it is still probably acting like what humans would act like. However, if these automated funds, the rules are adapting and reinforcing themselves with some kind of artificial intelligence that the machine itself be, will become some kind of trader, irrespective of how it got put in, then maybe things will change in that front. But I'm not too mm -hmm. sure. Maybe Valeria would know more about this. On the, on the concept of buying and selling, uh, the, the two things that you buy on facts and you sell on rumor, or, which, or maybe the, or whichever way around it is, I, if that thing exists, up to a certain extent, then in my opinion, this is what maybe what's causing, causes what's the certain degree of skewness because the negative side tends to be skewed a bit more than the right-hand side. The losses tend to be skewed a bit more mm. than, the, than the gains. So the skewness mm. could be because of, of your father's anecdote. But again, not too sure because, this, because we look at aggregate phenomena and the fund automated fund sides. I think I think Valeria probably is the expert here, or maybe somebody else. Anybody wants to talk about that? No. I'm happy to mention it because uh, I'm in I'm an investor, and those automated funds have been, in effect, had their uh, auto artificial intelligence roped down now because they uh, they were basically. Uh, jumping ahead. So now mm -hmm. the automated buying and selling of the index has actually had sand thrown in the machinery over the last few years. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, you've, you've had a dampening down of the tendency of tracker funds to, in effect, buy the index. Yeah. Valeria? I, th I think if, if, uh, if I'm not wrong, there are, there are evidences of the fact that the behavior of aut automatic uh, of machine making investments set up on rules uh, create an increase an increased systematic risk, which 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 can be better seen when uh, rumors spread and panic selling, for example, start. So the machine when certain thresholds are triggered, or the machine actually actively increasing the magnitude of certain events. Therefore, in a way, that was expected at least, is that the model should be even better performing when such a collective situation happened because the, at that point the fat tails become fatter and and while the, the center of the distribution of that of that waving function should be good for capturing all the interactions that those machines have when there is a sluggish market where you don't act or you don't act let that in that with the same magnitude that you do with the, with extreme events so in that respect if, if one can observe set set of periods in which this kind of phenomenon happened uh, could, I think it could be seen that the more systematic it is, the better should should the should the system work. I guess that's my understanding, at least. Thank you. Any more comments on this? Okay, we have a couple more questions in the chat box. Hey. Uh, uh, carry, so carry where on. should we start? Uh -huh. Okay, I'll carry Rutherford. Carry. Yeah. Could, could, you you, talk, could you, you, oh, could you use you, you go for it. What do you mean, Carrie, by use 1940 forward data? I'm just going to read the question for, for, for those who are not in the chat box. So Carrie asks, could you use 1900 or 1940 forwarded data so it has a larger discontinuities to hammer test the models? has a few I mean, larger discontinuities just a, models. Just that um, instead of just going further back, really. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can, uh, as I said, to be truthful, this, 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 this particular methodology or is, is going to work for data which is unimodal, right? And it's fairly symmetric and it's kind of a very, it's a, it's a kind of, it, it, it'll work for something where, where you've got a normal distribution and you either push it or you pull it, but don't break it into little bits. It's going to work. Okay, but it's all it does. Really it just compresses it. the thing or then it flattens it out. The C and K parameter flat, so it pushes it in and picks the fat tails or, or dumps the fat tails out and brings it a bit down. So it, if the topology issue is the same, this model will work basically. However, if the, 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 the shape is drastically different or there are sudden breaks in the data set or there's bimodal, then of course it, it can't work. Um, okay. uh, again, it doesn't really matter if, if, the, if the big thing becomes super kurtosis or super peaky, it'll work because K will just get larger and C will get smaller, I okay. think. Um, it, it won't work for uh, the case, as I said, where, where uh, it's a very different geometry from the from the normal distribution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we have a question from Joseph in the chat box. Um, you showed the modeling results against the S&P. Have you had similar success with other asset classes? And are there asset classes where the model has struggled? Uh, yes, we have used it on many different indices and it works quite well, but they're, in, they're similar to the S&P and there's no big deal. Um, recently, we have actually started working on minute data and uh, it, we got some very good results actually, which uh, coming, coming up with, it works perfectly well, but it's just that the, the econometric forecasting model, uh, we're still working on that to actually get it working. So once we've got that sorted, we should uh, be able to check, uh, give you some more information, Joseph. Yeah, but it does work. <clears throat> the, what will happen, what happens that when you go to more, when you go from day data, data to minute data and so on, um, you pick up 
much more finer structure on the autoregressive and moving average nature of KNC. So it's no longer just a AR1 or a <clears throat> AR1 model for KNC. You end up having some kind of ARIMA models. If I want to talk, if as you, you may know, some particular ARIMA, ARIMA, uh, more tricky ARIMA models to capture the pa underlying patterns inside KNC and possibly even might have to go to a, a vector vector autoregressive model which links up KNC as well inside the ARIMA model. But we're working on that. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing what, what comes out of it. And then of course, further down the line, if you got order book data, that would be even more in, uh, interesting. Thank you. Um, last shout for questions. Um, if anyone has any last minute burning questions before we, we wrap up um, today's lecture, um, please do speak now. Um, if not, Goji, I'm gonna hand over to you for final words of advice or inspiration, or just some parting words? No more questions, no. Well, oh, well thank you for being here. Thank you for um, having sharing your thoughts with me. Um, uh, thank you all. Um, uh, 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 Marcel's here from Belgium. Professor Auslus is a, is a great friend of mine, and he encouraged me to work on this, so I thank him so much. Thank you, Roy, as well. Thank you, everyone else. Uh, pleasure to be here. and. Um, Stay at home, save money. The more you drink, the more you'll save. Thank you. Um, I have just popped a link in the chat box to the the rest of the um, the rest of the lectures um, that are part of our third instalment of the LSBU Business School Professional Lecture Series. So do, so do check those out. Um, our next one um, is taking place on the. Give me two seconds, and I will tell you. Our next one is taking place on the 12th of May, and that's entitled Economic Crises, Recessions and the Employee Experience in SMEs. So do check those out. Gurji, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Neil. Thanks. Thank I appreciate you. that. Yep.